I got a friend named Campbell. He shoots steel in a gamble. And I guess he do mostly anything low down. He was out tomcatting one night when he stirred up a big old fight. And the big policeman came and snapped him down. He's in the jailhouse now. He's in the jailhouse now. Well, I told him once or twice to stop drinking gin and shooting dice. He's in the jailhouse now. Yodley, Chapter 11. Yodley, yodley. If there was ever a totally imbalanced hunt, which was completely unfair to the prey, coon hunting took the cake. First off, raccoon fur was an extremely profitable commodity, especially for mountain people who could make more money on a drunk Saturday evening than an entire week at work. Secondly, many people who lived on the outskirts of Melrose ate raccoon, squirrel, and deer on a regular basis. One year, some idiot thought it would be totally acceptable to serve barbecued raccoon with maple glaze as a festival item until some woman from Greenville found out about it and nearly vomited. Coon Dog Day brought as many as 1,000 coon hounds to the area trained since puppyhood to develop a hot scent and the ability to tree terrified coons. A hot scent was defined as a new scent versus a cold scent being an old scent, if that makes any sense. All day long, especially in the evening, you could hear those animals off in the distance howling. Most coon hunters use their coon hounds to legitimately hunt down wild raccoons in specific areas while the lazier and more inebriated hunters cheated, like Gudger and Victor, who began coon hunting at the tender age of four. They'd even their odds by secretly releasing their prized raccoons from traps that they had set weeks prior. The hunters would begin by shaking the caged raccoons under the nose of the hounds until they wanted to bite their little heads off. Then... Out of the cage, the terrified coons ran as minutes later several coon hounds were sent off to chase them down and up a tree for a ritualistic execution. The hunters would yell, Go, 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 go! Get on it! Get on it! Drunk hunters wearing their coal miner lights on their heads, bursting with pride in their silly sport, would stand silently and listen to the braying coon hounds off in the distance. Oh my, these finely tuned hunters were a sight to see as they honed their highly skilled craft. The hunters could tell when the hounds had been treed by the raccoons, then off they went with their flashlights, chewing tobacco, pistols, and moonshine. Once the men reached the cornered raccoons, they would collar their dogs and move them away from the base of the tree to prevent them from tearing the dead creatures completely apart. Then came the marksmanship phase of the sport as they shined their lights up at the terrified raccoon and lit up their eyes. I'll spare you the rest of the story. Coon hunting was a nocturnal, mostly male sport, with a clothing style that matched the mentality of the hunters. Some of the best hunters wore t-shirts, shorts, and tennis shoes all year long. They claimed that the corn liquor kept them warm and toasty. The top prize-winning hunters claimed stupid names like Duck Assassin, Speed Beef, and Woods Monster, while the coon hounds sported names like Rover, Copper, and Rusty. Occasionally, a girlfriend or wife would come along to see what coon hunting was all about and to watch the blood smearing, which was a ritualistic initiation of the newest hunters into the ranks. Gudger was known to be one of the best coon hunters and had the bragging rights to prove it, and hunting with a sheriff was a type of honor for the men. As expected, most hunters hated to include Victor, mainly because he'd never shut the hell up. Ignorance is bliss for a kid growing up in a remote, insulated town. But for me, the loss of ignorance meant misery. At the age of 17, during the summer after my ninth grade year, I had heard the word rape, but never could fully identify with its meaning. I knew that that sort of crime happened in large cities like Charlotte, Atlanta, but never in Melrose, North Carolina. Sure, we had our share of quirky old men in the community who my parents warned me to steer clear of, but a rapist? What in the hell was that? My father referred to people with deviated sexual motivations as perverts, and the townspeople minimized it even more, referring to them as, ah, he's just a dirty old man. The act of rape always seemed so foreign to me. I mean, who would do such a thing like that to another human being? 
and never was the subject of rape discussed from the pulpit, or in Sunday school for that matter. That would be a crime of the highest order. But after learning about Dr. Roy's examination of Miss Martha, and then listening to my mother and Victor on the phone, the definition of rape hit me dead in the face. I was now convinced that Victor was, in fact, my real father, and I was a mere product of rape. For a short period of time, I was angry at my parents for keeping something like that from me, but straying off in that direction was not where I needed to go. I knew it was going to be hard enough for me to even sit in the same room with either one of my parents. I now had a different face, different parents, and different soul. I don't remember reaching back down to the bottom of that golf bag and grabbing the gun, or even getting back on the truck with John, but what I do know was that gun had suddenly become the most important possession in my life. I was no longer frightened by the pistol, but strongly empowered by it. It felt good to hold the well-crafted firearm in my hand as we parked the truck by the shop at John's house and hiked through the woods to the old train trestle behind John's property. The train trestle was yet another place where John and I spent much of our time together. It was also a place where either one of us could have easily lost our lives. It was a concrete bridge about 120 feet above a shallow river with an extremely narrow edge for us to walk and run and even ride our bikes on. We had no fear of heights in those days as we tossed rocks and firecrackers over the side of the bridge. There was no protection, no gates on either side of the bridge that could prevent a child or kid from going over. If anyone fell over the side of that train trestle, they'd be dead. John and I sat on the edge of that bridge and stared down at the river far below. Tears filled my eyes as I thought about my poor mother and that horribly selfish man. As I told John about the conversation between my mom and Victor, I came so close to exploding into tears. But instead of breaking down entirely, I handed the gun to John, laid back on the hard ballast stones by the rails, and stared up at the late afternoon sky. The sun felt comforting on my face as I closed my eyes and breathed in the pungent scent of the creosote-treated railroad ties. After several minutes of silence, John confidently said, I've got an idea, Rainy Ray, and a plan that should even things out a bit. John's plan was that we were to meet above the Western Auto at about 10 p.m. He was confident that both Gudger and Victor, if he was sober, would be off on the traditional night hunt the evening before Coondog Day. Gudger always claimed that he and a select few of his officers would be on the hunt to supervise and make sure that things didn't get out of hand like years before, back when Dacus Pace stepped on a rattlesnake and accidentally shot his nephew Klein in the butt. Dacus never lived that incident down. Based on tradition, John was sure that Gudger would leave the patrol car in the hands of one of his prized deputies while he stayed in contact with his brand new federal signal voice patrol radio. When I asked John what his plan was, he said, Just meet me up there at 10 Rainy Ray and bring your balls. My buddy was suddenly turning into some kind of tough guy, and I think he didn't want to tell me what his plans were because he thought I'd chicken out. He would be correct on that assumption, because if I knew what we were going to be doing later that evening, I'm sure it would have never happened. I fell asleep on the roof of the Western Auto at about 9 p.m. as the heat of the day warmed the rooftop and lured me off to slumber. Most of the festival tents were erected and all of the volunteers had gone home for the day. A huge sign had been installed just above the playground by a group of Bible-thumping fanatics that read, You can't hold hands with God and dance with Satan at the same time. But even they had left for the day. I'm sure that both God and Satan had had enough of the dreadful heat and sent their disciples on their way, as the thermometer during the day surpassed 104 degrees. Mayor White was back in town, warning festival-goers that an intense thunderstorm was forecasted to arrive just after sundown the next day, while Doc Jones told the mayor to pipe down. Everything is just going to be perfect on Coondog Day. The Beretta was in my lap and the burlap bag was under my head, serving as one of my makeshift pillows as I slept under the stars. Wake up, sir.
Rise and shine, Rainy Rain. I opened my eyes to the sight of John standing above me with a coiled rope over his neck and shoulders and a large wicker clothes hamper at the base of his feet. What are you doing with all that stuff, John? Just come with me and keep quiet. We crossed over to the jail and moved the service panel. Grab that side, Rainy Ray, and let's move the whole thing off to the side. Only one time before we opened the hatch that far, and that was the time we climbed down a water pipe and into the sheriff's office. You can't go down there now, John. It's way too early. What if someone comes? Rainy Ray, now we're going to do this thing. And you're going to do this thing with me, okay? Handing me the coil of rope, he tied a special kind of knot around the handles of the clothes hamper and gently lowered the basket to the floor of the sheriff's office. What are you doing with that? We're going to cause a little future disturbance between Victor and Gudger, John said as he eased over the opening, lowered his legs, and grabbed a hold of the water pipe and then shimmied his way down to the floor. All right now, Rainy Ray, give me some slack on that rope and be ready to pull up your first delivery. What was he doing now, I wondered, as I watched him move over to the side of the room where the picture was on the wall and where Gudger stashed his corn liquor. Are you crazy, John? You just can't steal that stuff. If we get caught, we'll both be dead. Work with me, Rainy Ray. Shut up. Just work with me. Before I knew it, John and I were committing a felony. Or were we? We were breaking into the sheriff's office and sort of stealing town property. Or were we, I thought, as I lifted my first load of more than a dozen mason jars of Gudger's precious moonshine through the opening and onto the roof. Never had I feared more for my life and smiled so much as we emptied Gudger's entire stash of booze. Just as John was leaving, I watched him load a sheet of stationery into the typewriter on Gudger's desk and start typing away. When he was done, he placed the note where the corn liquor was, moved the painting back in place, and then climbed back up to the top of the roof. <sighs> I was laughing so hard that I think I wet my pants. What did the note say, John? I asked as I sat down on the roof and looked up at him. Well, it said, Gudger, you should have never embarrassed me that way in front of them boys. Now I'm gonna make it crystal clear to you that you'd better keep the heat off me, or else. <laughs> Yodelay, yodelay, yodelay. I went out last Tuesday. I met a sweet little girl named Susie, and I guess she was the sweetest thing in town. She started calling me honey, and I began to spend my money, and we got drunk and thought we owned the town.